Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is the Wix online meeting 162, rolling our way through the middle of January. Uh, we have a lot of stuff to discuss because, well, we said we would discuss a bunch of things. Um, as always, we'll do triage first. Well, I guess not always. Today we'll do triage first, then we'll talk about a bunch of different things that have been popping up on the Wix devs mailing list, plus uh, an item that Jacob threw in right before the meeting. So let's go ahead and get going. Fortunately, triage won't take us too long by the way, before I move up the slide. These meetings are recorded for those of you that aren't here with us right here, right now. I know a few people are looking forward to it based off topics discovered, discussed. So uh, let's go do the hopefully not terribly exciting, but good stuff triage. Um, the bottom one here, because these bottom two are still assigned to me. Um, we've asked for him to, or her to provide more information about their logging, and we don't, or try and do more logging, and we don't have any more information. Uh, one more week. Yeah, it's carried over. I'll, right. I'll add a ping. Uh, yeah, one more ping, and then we'll go. Uh, might not be a thing. Wix build output throws an exception. Well, clearly that's a user thing that we should handle correctly. Um, I guess you can, well, we should definitely toss this in four, and you can assign it to me. Okay. Unless you want it, Bob. Um, but I assume you're off working on more interesting things than command line error handling. Well, I did open the bug. Up to you. You or me, it's good. Um, extensions should version their IDs. So this is a thing that we are going to uh, dis... Oh, no. Uh. All right, I'm going to discuss this quickly because we actually have this as part of a larger conversation later. Um, Bob pointed out here that it is possible to build a merge module with both Wix 3 custom actions and Wix 4 custom actions in it. Well, actually, my my scenario is consuming a merge module that was built with Wix 3. Ah, into in say a Wix 4 um, MSI. That's even a better scenario. So Wix yeah, 3 yeah. based merge module that has, let's say, the util CA because it's a kitchen sink. And then you're building your Wix 4 based product that also has util CA in it. Um, when you attempt to bring the merge module in, it will collide in all kinds of bad ways because the IDs for things in util CA are just, you know, Wix whatever or whatever like that. Um, the same would happen if you were using just Wix libs, if you had a Wix 3 Wix lib, although you can't bring in Wix 3 Wix libs in the Wix 4, at least not today. That may come back. We have to figure that, but at this point, definitely cannot do that. So uh, I guess it's really only merge modules. Um, that brought in a Wix 3 content with Wix 4 content have the same IDs and then uh, they collide because, well, like the binary is, I forget, Wix util CA, and, which is fine for isolating it within the Wix namespace, our namespace, but not so good if you have both 3 and 4. Um, so we probably, the most straightforward way to solve this is to, as Bob points out, to namespace all of our stuff with Wix Four, since we can't retroactively go back and fix Wix three, um, but that includes like IDs and um, possibly tables if necessary, and so on and so forth. Yeah, the, the I think you're right. The immediate problem is that it just won't work because of collisions. Yeah. Um, a scarier scenario is that it works um, due to say uh, some of the IDs getting modularization goods appended. Um, in which case you might end up where you have two sets of custom actions both reading from the same table. Yeah. So table names were actually my biggest concern, but at the moment, yeah, it's it's fairly well busted. Yeah, so this is probably something we need to think about. And this ties into one of our topics to discuss today. So um, I want to leave this here for now because we'll come back around next week or you know maybe Bob will come back and update this thing. Um, but uh, I want to keep this in mind as we think about how we want to solve the other issue that's floating out there. Right. Um, so anyway, keep this in mind that we have an ID collision when Wix 3 and Wix 4 combined together. Um, someone then also said they want to do the whole little thing that I've seen other installers do where you get to pick your UI before the installer comes up. They said they were interested in doing this work. Um, I pointed out that they should really go through this development, our development guide. They said they read it and decided to ignore it. So I decided to point out the most important part that we aren't really taking features in Wix 3, 
And then he realized why I told him that he should have talked about all this. And so we'll see if he comes back with this on Wix 4 or if he chooses to maintain this on a private fork of Wix toolset and maintain it and all that kind of good stuff. So uh, his decision, her decision, whoever that is, um, we will uh, wait and see what they decide on that. Um, so let's leave this open for another week just in case there's answers because these conversations were happening like literally last night. And we'll see what this comes to next week. Okay. Just as a reminder. All right. As I expected, triage is going to be pretty easy because the biggest thing in here uh, was the um, shit extensions version of their IDs, which is an item we're going to talk about. But that is not the first item we're going to talk about. <coughs> Excuse me. The first item we're going to talk about is voted for Visual Studio 2019 preview. Um, so Chris Painter did the work to already give us this build. Sorry. History. History. Uh, typically, support for the next version of Visual Studio from the list toolset has come at roughly an RTM plus a month or two or three. Um, and uh, that that's, was okay-ish uh, because the Visual Studio releases were, you know, three years apart or whatever, and it took that long for us to kind of get Votive straightened out and working. Um, but Votive, or sorry, Visual Studio releases are now coming faster and faster and previews are coming faster. Um, and we still don't have anybody really working on Votive. Uh, so we're going to get faced with this issue more often of, well, when do we support uh, Visual Studio next with any given of Votive? Now, the nice thing is that Votive was extracted into a separate repo, which means it's been decoupled from the core Wix toolset, so it can release on its own. So in the specific case of Visual Studio, Visual Studio 2019 Preview 1, uh, Painter did the work to copy the 2017, bring it over to 2019, update all the version numbers, and has verified that it works on his machine um, in the 2019 release. And that's great. That's kind of what we hoped it, that the visuals, the votive repo would allow us to do. Um, and we have that pull request, and I think Sean's even committed it, or Sean has uh, approved it, committed it. Um, the the challenge that came from that, given that this is the first time that we've had all these processes in place and actually use them, is uh, when do we release these previews? Um, the natural assumption was that we'd go up to Visual Studio Marketplace, put the extension up there, uh, maybe you can even mark them preview now, and put it up there. Um, my experience has not been real positive in putting anything that doesn't work perfectly up on Visual Studio Marketplace. You get basically a one-star review with no comment, or you get people that comment and say, hey, this just doesn't work. None of that behavior is really what we want to um, encourage people doing. Um, and so I hesitated on doing the work to push it up on Marketplace. And then I kind of got mentally stuck there for a while, um, going, well, what do we do with it? until, I don't know, a couple of days ago that I finally went, oh, hey, how about we just release this up on our own private shares? People that want to use it can uh, play with it there, and they will not have the, uh, they will not be in the space of Visual Studio Marketplace to mark, you know, a Visual Studio 29 preview as, hey, this doesn't work. Instead, they'll be already on GitHub or our website that it would be, hey, let me go file an issue on this, which is what you should do in that case. So I would like to propose that our process for releasing votive previews um, and even you know RTM build before we're prepared to do that is to do actually what we're already doing. And I don't know why I forgot about this, probably because I did all this votive stuff and promptly flushed it because I don't spend that much time working on votive, is that we publish them to um, GitHub and we mark them pre-release on GitHub. Um, and so here they would be on, we could just do a build with this. Visual Studio 2019 should show up here, and then we can say, yeah, if you want to try it out here, go to our private GitHub location. At some point in the future, one of these builds will be promoted to RTM, you know, and then you'll be able to go to the marketplace and get it. Um, so most people won't find it. Only people looking for a preview would be able to find it, and they could always ask us when we point them out here. So that's kind of what I'd like to do. Any thoughts on that process? We can still publicize it. We Blog post, news still, item. We could. I don't know that I want to, but we could. Well, I don't. I, sorry, I was reacting to the. You know, they have to ask us. Oh. I'd like to get out out of that business. 
Yeah, I mean, yeah. If you come here and look for a release, you're like, hey, look, I found that release. Great, you can go grab that release. I just don't want to put all of the uh, essential versus marketplace is marketing wrapper around it. Yeah, no, no, I completely design, agree with that. I don't want it there. So I thought this was as good a place to put it. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, I think that's good. All right, all right. Sean, you were the one that was kind of leading the charge on this most, um, and I've been dragging my heels on it. Um, and then uh, we can go from there. Uh, we could publicize it on the Wix downloads page where we have the list of all the Visual Studio builds, uh, um, all the Visual Studio extensions to download, which point at Marketplace. We could have 2019 point at here with a pre-release. So basically, basically, I want to keep 2019 off the Marketplace until you know yep. we have some confidence in it. So I think we could do that. All right. Um, good. I think that's that issue. Let's move on because we have more to discuss. So the net result is that uh, we will publish these to our GitHub place, and then people that want to try them out can try them out, and then the bugs can get resolved from that point on. Moving on. Wix extension versioning. This is a thread that's been going on, interestingly, on Wix devs. Um, I was trying to quickly summarize this as I was adding this topic just this morning. Um, the issue we have here, um, and I don't know if this is like a discussion that spilled over after the last meeting or if it was on the tail end of the last meeting, I forget. Um, it was uh, in the meeting. It, it was or was not? It was in the meeting. It was in the meeting. All right, so let's have a kind of a more formal, I, I think I've, I've summed up the two options that we kind of had at the end of that one, <clears throat> and let's get a little more, <laughs> more discussion on it. Um, the issue, of course, is that if there is a change in a Wix extension that is not backwards compatible for whatever reason, a bug fix that forces us to do something that's you know, not backwards compatible in any way, shape, or form, um, how do we handle that knowing that we're publishing these as NuGet packages, therefore, you know, uh, and NuGet has a strong affinity to semantic versioning, which would say that if a uh, breaking changes in place, you need to change the major version. So if we look at option one, where we did pure semantic versioning with you know, Wix toolset.firewall.wix extension, and we said version 4.0 because that's the version of the firewall that matches with the Wix toolset 4.0, which kind of makes sense, that all lines. If there is a breaking change to Wix toolset firewall extension, then according to Semfer, we would need to make it version 5.0 which of course there is no Wix toolset 5.0, so our nice tying of these two things together breaks and users now have to figure out how to map 5.0 actually goes to 4 and then later on there will be a 6 when we introduce another breaking changes in Wix toolset 5 and that and it just the versioning gets really crazy. Um, and so I probably shouldn't call this pure semver, this is uh, ignore semver, I, I don't, uh, or ignore the more rules of Semver. So the idea would be that if Wix toolset firewall that Wix extension had a breaking change, it would just have another version and it would be a breaking change and users would have to deal with that um, in the change, which is basically the way we deal with most software that is not fine semantic versioning. You just have to read the release notes to know that, hey, there's a breaking change across here. Um, the m largest mitigation to that is that we don't often have breaking changes within extensions, um, but you know that's that's a kind of a, a fatal or a, a final uh, point of a way of looking at it. Um, that if you make that decision, there's no real way out of it that doesn't lead to a bad place. So the second option is to take the version of Wix and put it into the identifier somewhere. So something like Wix toolset dot firewall four dot Wix extension. And then we would be able to version those starting at, you know, presumably 1.0 and have them start marching up from there. Um, this has the nicety that it maps uh, to the, you know, the version of Wix is in the ID, so it's very easy to see that this um, that this uh, extension is a for extension. Um, and when we have a breaking change, you could decide when to go from one to two, and so on and so forth, and follow uh, versioning. Um, it is a little bit harder to upgrade to Wix 5, arguably, if you have to go there and change firewall 4 to firewall 5 um, and reset the versions. Um, for the, the option 1, it would be, yeah, you just change to 4 to 5. 
um, option one, I guess, does have the option or the scenario where when Wix 5 comes out, people could try to upgrade their 4 to 5 extension and break. So it's kind of like trade-offs between these two options. I haven't heard of a third option um, that isn't a you know, minor variation on one of these two here. So I was just kind of looking for the people here. Have I missed any scenarios? Does this kind of lay it out? And if so, do people have a preference for the way that these work? Well, I think option two is better. I would go that way. One thing to keep in mind is that the the extensions will always have a hard reference to the version of the the version of Wix toolset dot data and accessibility at the very least um, that they're designed for. So we have all these micro repos and we're, we have way more flexibility, but to an extent there's still a train. It's just now the major version train. Correct. Correct. So my issue that we discussed earlier aside, um, I don't know that I care a whole lot. In, in, the, in, in the very unlikely event that we would, we would make a breaking change during a you know, particular Wix major release life cycle, a breaking change in an extension during a particular Wix release cycle lifetime, blah, 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 um, it just seems really unlikely that this is something we're going to have to worry about. Um, to an extent, if, if we make a breaking change, it's more like we're going to abandon something, you know, uh, I, uh, the firewall extension is going to have a bunch of new features, and but it's going to break compatibility with Windows XP. So, well, right. who cares? And eventually dumps XP kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, which actually it should do anyway. Um, I just uh, I have a tough time imagining when this is going to happen within a particular works version. Well, I think it was that 64-bit that I brought up last time. Oh, okay, okay. That's hey, Good. look, an actual scenario instead of one I'm just making up. And I still don't recognize that as <laughs> as a breaking change. <laughs> 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 I understand the point of view that it is a breaking change. I don't recognize it as a breaking change, but sure. Um, I, well, I, I think you're never wrong. saying you're going to have a break. Yeah, yes, I, I, I'm prepared for you to take that position. Um, <laughs> wow, that was politic. Um, <laughs> I, I am, I am. Option one scares me a little bit. Other than I'm willing to just kind of go, yeah, semantic versioning is kind of a pain in the ass and doesn't work well for this scenario. So, whatever. Uh, Basically, option one is, yeah, whatever, Semper. So um, I'm inclined personally mostly to option two, also because all of the IDs and the tables and the custom actions need to change. So that, that four there needs to be a four in all those tables and everything else. And to me, that kind of creates these, uh, a, a line or a, a trace through everything that says these all went together. Um, yeah, and that also addresses my concern about the 64-bit thing. It's a major change. It would ju we'd be justified in in bumping the major version yep, uh, so that people have to opt in, which is really all that you know Sumber's about, right? Sumber's big thing is you're not surprised by a change because you you know the rules say that you won't be surprised unless you agree to it. Semver is about using the version piece of metadata as the way to communicate those breaking changes. That's what Semver yeah. is about. And yeah. I'm not thrilled about using the version in that way, but no. that is the thing that has captured people's imagination. And so that's what is most common out there. Yeah. Um, so if only because it addresses my concern. Um, uh, I, don't, I don't like the looks of option two, but I think it's probably the best option to go with. Yeah. So on a 
this is a thing we all have to discuss, and I don't know that I want to discuss it here. Cause it'll be, I think it'll be just as easy to discuss an email than getting through all these different options. I actually thought there's more just agreement than where we were, so it was actually going faster than I thought it would. We can lay out all the different permutations of option two, given that we're leaning that way, of where to put the number in the ID, and then go from there. Because I think we all agree how the version number will work. It'll start at one, and it will move up as per Sember. So that's pretty straightforward there. The question is, where does the number four go in the ID? We can send out emails and lay out all the different permutations and maybe have a meeting later, we can choose one or we'll figure it all out. The one Are there thing more than two choices? Uh, it's well, either Wix Toolset 4 or Firewall 4. So Wix Toolset 4 is not an option because we need to maintain that first name dot as our namespace, as our organization namespace within NuGet. On NuGet.org. Correct. So we could attempt to go acquire Wix Toolset, Wix Toolset 4, and things like that, but that's not the intent of it. Yeah, so we yeah, really no. can't put a a modifier in that f before that first dot. <laughs> okay. Well, then. So, like Jacob points out, you could put Wix toolset dot v4 dot firewall Wix extension, but I think that's no. pretty ugly. So, uh, that's the question. We could make it Wix toolset dot firewall dot Wix extension 4. We could put the number on the end of Wix extension. That's not terrible either. Anyway, these are the things that we can discuss in email, lay out all the various permutations that we can come up with. <laughs> And people can kind of sit and think about which of these do we think looks the least worst, I think, is in the end. Okay. And then this would just be for the Wix extension, right? We wouldn't yeah. put it in any of the other ones? I, I, I think so. I'm, do we want to enter, like, does anybody want to put it in the other ones? No, I guess I just... From your initial response, I thought you were against option two because you wanted to be consistent and put it everywhere. But I guess I didn't realize everywhere just meant the extensions. Yeah, sorry, everywhere meant the extensions. I don't. I. I think the core tools can move normally. I.e. Semver. I.e. Semver. Yes. Okay. Sounds good to me. unless someone wanted to argue otherwise. I have a hard time arguing otherwise, so I'm just, you know, I don't know that I want Wix toolset dot data for, or whatever. Um, and to Jacob's yeah. point about finding the for everywhere, that's a point we should discuss in email. I agree with the whole ability to upgrade and search, replace, and change all fours to fives when you need to do that. That might say, hey, let's make it dot Wix extension four at the end so you can replace all dot Wix extension four with dot Wix extension five and fix it everywhere. That might suggest that is a best option, a better option there. Or we could put the four in the middle, Wix four extension, I don't know. These are all permutations we can toss in emails and discuss and come back and vote when people have time to think about it, as opposed to trying to decide all the permutations when speaking them, which isn't even easier. <laughs> Perfect example where it's easier to write them down. All right, so I think this says we're moving forward with option two and we will discuss where the number goes in the ID, and the versions will be 1.0 for the first release and change as per semver rolls from there. All right. So are we gonna start with one right now, or would we keep it 0. Dot something until we actually release? Oh, uh, it'll be semver, so right now 0. Dot, you know, whatever for pre-releases is totally reasonable. And then we'll bump it. The, the first official release will be 1.0. And then some build, you know, number at the end. Okay. One dot zero dot, you know, two one whatever. Because we're using Git versioning for all these things, it'll be whatever the height of the repo is at the time that we build, um, you know, one dot zero, and it will get reset with the version number. So it'll be like one dot zero dot one at the end, and the next change will be however many commits we make before we release the next version, so on and so forth. Still following semver. That dot minor, the build number is for newer builds. Cool? Yeah. Jacob brought up just before the meeting, um, what is our current procedure for committing to Wix 4? Um, in the past, Wix 3 had a 
history.md that was maintained with a very nice tool that um, Sean put together so you could drop your your make your markdown files in a separate history folder and it would automatically add them to the history.md for us. It was great. Um, our release notes were based off of that history MD. Everything was uh, peachy keen, as my old English teacher would say. Um, with the micro repos, we've kind of blown up the ability to have a single history MD um, without shipping around and distilling it down and so on and so forth. Um, does anybody have, and I know I've sprung this on everybody, but uh, and thus far, sorry, continuing on my thread, in V4, so far we've been mostly just making the structural changes and general making all of Wix work in the new model with all of the breakdown with the NuGet packages and stuff like that to line us up on that way. Do we have, does anybody have any opinions about maintaining release notes in V4 given what we've done with micro repos? Any opinions? Um, or is this just something of, yeah, we're fine, right? All right, we're living without them right now, and we'll have to go back and figure out how to put them back in later. Well, I guess, so the, when are we going to release release notes? <laughs> uh, well, in the past, release notes went out whenever they, uh, whenever the new uh, build went out, so it ended up in our, you know, our Atom feed for all the downloads and all that kind of stuff. And in NuGet, there's a place to stick release notes in the NuGet package. I guess we would... Oh, do but that. we don't. We're not going to have a centralized build, are we? No, but we do. But each build that releases its output will have its own. So, like Wix toolset.data, right? We can add release notes to that. Um, same for extensibility. All the extensions would be fine. So the one that's tricky is core is the one that doesn't release its output. It gets consumed by a couple places, mo most just tools. So tools is the place that would include all the release notes for core and any changes in tools. And data and accessibility. Um, if, it, if, it wanted, if, it wanted, if we wanted to roll them all yeah. up, tools would have to roll up all those dependencies that it has, yes. Right, so, so there, there are two bits here. One is you know, traditionally, we haven't done release notes. <laughs> traditionally, for major releases, we write the release notes as pros, whereas history.md and its predecessors were all about, you know, essentially per commit information. Not necessarily per commit, especially before we started using Git, but basically it was you know, it was, it was a per change thing. So for you know, a major release, that's not useful, right? You don't need to see every bug fix that went in to Wix 4 before you started using it or before it even chipped as alpha. So that level of release note isn't very interesting. So um, how do you write the pros? Um, well, in my case, the answer is no, it didn't. Oh, you just went back to the commits anyway? I went back to the commits. Mm -hmm. um, because, yeah, because basically there's um, there's interesting data in, in history.md, um, <clears throat> but certainly since we moved to GitHub, there's just as much data available from pull requests and issues. So, and I have a, you know, I started out in this industry as a writer, so I have a certain perspective, which is, you know, trying to automatically collate commit messages is not how you produce interesting or useful release notes. Um, so maybe, maybe the answer is that we just, I mean, now that we're all GitHub, we're bought into the GitHub monoculture. Um, maybe the answer is just that we have issues tied to milestones, and if we do a good work with tying issues to milestones, which we that's how we triage, so that shouldn't be too hard, that should work out pretty well then. Right? That, um, that The answer would be, if you want to see what's fixed in this, go look at the, the individual commits and changes. You go look at the issues tagged for Wix 4, for example. Um, uh, well... Yeah, except generally, again, 
in a major release, I think that breaks down because that's that's at that per issue, per change level that you know some of, some of them will be useful, but most of them will not. Like you know. The, the bug I opened about, you know, Wix, that XC build, output type, yeah, not yeah, specified right. credit. You know, that's not useful, right? No. Um, that's just an intermediate mistake. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I don't think there's a good, I don't think we, I don't think there's a good story for how we do release notes for V4.0. What we want to look at, I think, is, is you know, what we do, um, you know, for V4.1 or for V.4.0.1. It's, it's the after, after a major reset, you know, what do you capture? And that's where I think it's more interesting to have per change level stuff. Um, and and part of me is like I, I'm I'm intrigued by the idea that you know we could have like history.md that's more interesting, where we write more information, say, than in a commit message, um, except. Historically, that has not proven to be the case. At best, they're identical to the commit message, yeah. um, which means it's just you know another thing to do. Yeah. I don't know that that's it's useful to to maintain that. Um, people would ask. Some people would ask, "What was fixed in this particular build?" Yeah, uh, absolutely, absolutely. And it could help with that. And every build's just going to have one change, right? Uh, not not tool like you could see us making several fixes to core and then pushing tools at some point later. So there would be several fixes to core, and then tools gets updated with the grab the new core and then publish. So as far as NuGet.org is concerned, we would have skipped like dot one hundred to dot one five or something. Well, no, because most people again are going to be looking at tools. Like, you know, I, I rolled up probably a dozen changes between data and core into a tools build, or sorry. I've made a dozen changes, say, in, in core and data, um, but I only just rolled that up into a tools build. Mm -hmm. So uh, tools is the tools is what people are going to use in the yep. you know in the NuGet based world. Yeah, tools so, is the publish point. Yeah. For or for at least the primary tools. one. Yeah, the, I mean for. For the tools, for the for the, for the things that people typically use, right? If you're using data, then data can be published faster, and extensibility can be published faster. But <coughs> tools is predominantly what people grab, unless it's an extension, then you'll grab that. Extensions move on their own timeline. Per build, tell them to go to the Git history. Per official release, farm the issue tracker. Yeah, so I, I mean, what Bob says now is that if we do a good job tagging our our um, the issues in the the correct milestone, then Bob said that that's normally what he would have done anyway. That plus you know the Git history to do release notes all up release notes. So as long as we continue to tag things in the correct milestone, that should be okay. Um, that should work as expected. And then, yeah, we could tell people to go look at the Git history per release. Um, one option is to tag every build. No, that won't work. Yeah, we don't have a single version number across them all. So I don't know. We could add tags at the end of every build. That that's a little over, maybe a little overkill. Um, but we could do that if there is value in that. That actually shows up 
in the GitHub UI. Yes, and we would end up with lots of tags. Yeah, that that starts to get unnavigable. Um, yeah, this, this is. I mean, this is actually kind of an interesting problem. Thinking about it from, um, like, you know, when during various, well, primarily 3.0, I did essentially release notes on my blog for every build of Wix. But it was just, you know, routinely once a week. Um, I could collect all those things. Um, and, and yeah, I used the moral equivalent of commits to do those. Um, starting from the, the history text. Um, so, so that gets, that gets to be interesting because again, we're gonna, you know, I did those during the development of 3.0, um, but not from the beginning. You know, so there's a bunch of stuff, you know, high level summary, you know, hey, look, you don't have to generate short file names anymore. Yay. Um, And then, you know, primarily it was interesting to capture new features that went in for people who were using pre-release Wix 3.0. Um, and likewise with bug fixes. Yeah, you know, bug was fixed, people were stuck on it. Hey, now you know about it. That's all good information to have. Um, but it does kind of, you know, start to point to, to having to do all of this manually. If we tag every release in Git with the build, then you end up with the markers in the Git history that you can do the diff in between build to build. I mean, you can just visually see the differences. There is, it does add that value. Um, it, when you look at a timeline view of you know the Git history, you see little tags sticking out on commits. Um, We could do them only when committing on master. Like right now, we're committing directly to master. I'm not sure we're going to continue to do that in the end. That we may end up at a point where we, like core, ends up with a develop branch that we commit again several times, and then we decide yes, this is good. Now let's publish a core um, to master. Right. I don't know that we'll do that, but that may be something we do. And then in that case, you'd only get tags on the master builds, which are the things that are then made available to downstream like tools. And that will show up on GitHub. Oh, uh, sorry, NuGit.org. And then tools can show up on NuGit.org, right? And, yeah, right. Core, core is a weird one because it doesn't get published to NuGit.org, but yeah. But data and accessibility would. Um... I guess part of this, we have to decide, you know, what we're going to do. This isn't just, um, uh, it's not just a mechanical thing of how do we do it. It's like we have to decide what we want to do. Because the whole model's changed. Micro-repos and, and NuGet packages change the model. Yep. It used to be that, that, you know, little blurbs were good enough for frequent small changes builds, um, and then we did a release, and that was the sign that we needed to write release notes, which I volunteered for far too often. Um, but now we're going to a model where we're going to have both of those things, and that's like, I don't know, I don't know the system that should be in place for that. Uh-huh. So right now we're not maintaining history MD. I'm okay with the set of things that we're doing. I think right now, uh, Jacob was asking, how do you go forward and and you know, what's the best, the appropriate way to fix an issue, um, or, you know, to fix something. And I think if it's not, you know, like the stuff that you and me and Sean have been doing, which is basically just making everything work in the new micro world and stuff like that, or clearly like yeah, this just making this work. Um, but things that have issues or someone else open the issue. If an issue is open on the work you're doing in Wix 4, and not everything has an issue because it's like, make binding work or make bundles work. All right, we're not going to open issue for that. But if an issue is open, like I think the uppercase 
thing that Jacob was talking about most here, <coughs> excuse me, um, then it, you should make sure that you have the uh, the PR that you send against the appropriate repository correctly ties itself to its issue and will close the issue when merged. The other thing that we've been doing that's helpful is even for even for the, well, all sorts of changes that we've been doing in Works 4, we've been lately, anyway, have been doing pull requests. So there's, you know, a um, you don't have to go spelunking through individual commits to write release notes. If something required a PR, it's there, and that can, you know, form the basis for release notes because, frankly, they're going to collect comments uh, probably better than issues would. But PRs aren't tagged to a milestone unless they're tagged to an issue, are they? I don't... They can. They oh, can. Yep. All right. So maybe that's the other process we should enact then is that PR should be tagged to the appropriate milestone. I think that'll give us the searchability in the end. That'll give us the data now that whatever we decide later, we'll be able to search back and find things. Sure. Um, all right. And all the PRs against, you know, for at this point have been all been against 4.0 because, hey, it's all new. But yeah. um, so, all right. So the process which we should capture is, one, open a pull request, which is going to be straightforward for everybody except three of us that have direct commit access to the master branch, the origin branch. So uh, we're doing that. So everybody's setting pull requests. Pull requests should be tagged for the appropriate um, milestone, and pull requests should be um, associated with the issue that they fix if there is such an issue. And that should get us all the data closed together in a tight loop so that we don't lose any information, and it'll all be captured on GitHub. Right. And then we can make larger decisions as we get more experience with how we want to be releasing these things. What does release notes mean for them? Does that answer your short term of your your um, standard operating procedure question, Jacob? So how are we supposed to do multi-repository pull requests? Or like, do we want people to keep the title the same? or? Is there something we want to do to somehow tie them together? Issues and pull requests? The, the, I think an the, issue can tie them. Uh, the pull request should be targeted to the repository it goes to. If the title should be the same, it can be the same. If it's different, it can be different. I don't think that has to be the way we tie it together. I think if there really is something that needs to be tied together, create an issue for it and then have them all relate to the, have all the pull requests relate to that same issue. Yeah, actually, that's the the next level of uh, okay. We have PRs. Everything has a has a pull request. Um, if something also has an issue, it means you know, well, it can mean a bunch of things. But at the very least, if you create an issue um, and tie it with with one or more pull requests, it's a sign that oh, hey, this is something that maybe should be documented. Yeah, I, I've made, like, in my case, I've had case uh, situations where I fixed something in data because it was just busted that then had downstream breaking changes. Those are more sure. rare now, but they, they have happened. And so the fix is whatever it is in data, and then the fix in the downstream repositories is absorbing the fix, you know, absorbing this version of data, right? So you're like, all right, why did you grab this version of data? You have to go back to data to look at why that version was interesting. Just right, because it, it wasn't a fix in core; it was a fix in data, and core just had to pick it up at some point and make sure right. it worked. So I, I'm fine with that sort of thing because we're going to get in a space where the commits to tools. I firmly expect that in three months or so, the the commits to tools are all going to be updating the version of core to number X, right? Yeah. <laughs> Even now, most of them are Bob asking for a new build. So when we go to hard coded, when we go to explicit versions, not hard coded versions, explicit versions, then the fix is going to be tools now absorbing, you know, or now integrating version whatever from core. And you're like, great, boom, now ship it. 
Um, and I, I firmly expect that that's what's going to happen there. <clears throat> the issue number in the title actually doesn't tie it because... Uh, it's cross-repo. Yeah, it's cross-repo. No, so the, the way to tie a PR is to say Wix toolset slash issues number and then the number and say something like fixes or whatever and that'll make it automatically close for you. The title should not contain the issue number unless somehow that works well for the title of the PR. The body of the PR should say, you know, related to or fixes. I mean, whatever it does, you know, closes Wix toolset slash issues number, whatever. It's the standard GitHub um, issue referencing behavior. I mean, typically we've been saying Wix bug or Wix speed and then yeah. the issue number. Yeah, that was back when we had our own issue tracker. That came from back when we had our own standard standalone issue tracker. It came from SourceForge. And even, yeah, SourceForge before that. You're right. So, anyway, uh, Wix toolset slash issues number and then the issue number will get you the appropriate syntax. It's it's pretty easy once you get used to it. It's like, yeah, Wix tool says slash issues is their issues repo, and then the number is the number, and you're good to go. Um, all right. I think that's pretty good. Anything else people want to talk about? We've talked a lot about a different a bunch of release stuff, but that's good because it's progress on Wix 4 type thing. So. Um, anything anybody else wants to talk about? Stuff going on in their world. For the bow extension, is um, there any reason you didn't create the build for that one? Uh, no, I missed it. I, I had a very bad couple weeks here, so um, I will go fix that. <laughs> I try to get them as soon as I, I get the mail, and if I get a bunch of mail, sometimes I'll like, miss one in the middle. But I will go hurry up and make that real quick. Is it it's the ball extension? Okay. I'll go look. Uh, anything else? All right, a little under an hour, so it's a good meeting. Uh, we'll be back, I assume, in two weeks. I don't think there's anything special. Whoops, wrong button. Um, yeah, 31st of January. Uh, that should work. All right, so we'll be back in two weeks. We'll do a triage. We'll see where we're at with all progress on all these other things. And until then, you guys take it easy. Bye. Bye. Bye.